Please turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17 to 24. So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They're darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they've given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught to in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. This is the word of the Lord. We uh, live in an age where it's often said that uh, teenagers and uh, adolescents seem to go on forever and uh, men are refusing to uh, grow up and take responsibility. Uh, it's, a, it's a dangerous thing when a man gets married and continues to live as if he's a single man. Uh, it's a dangerous thing uh, for someone to become a parent and, and live as if they're, they're not parents. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a, uh, when, when there's stages of life, we, we, when we're not who we were and we become something new, we need to embrace that fully. Uh, that's different than, say, being a dual citizen. Uh, some of you will know I'm a citizen of both Australia and New Zealand, and uh, I choose which teams I'll support. And uh, that means even that I, I sometimes support New Zealand cricket. Uh, it's that underarm incident that some of you remember from long ago. Uh, but God doesn't give us that choice. He makes us something new. And uh, Paul in this chapter has been trying to urge the church uh, not only to grow up, uh, not to, to remain as infants, just just drinking milk, but to, to grow up, but also uh, not to resemble the people around them. In, in, in verses 17 to 19, which we've already looked at, he says he insists that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. So although there's been this radical break, he says, uh, for many of you, you're indistinguishable and you must stop living uh, just like those around you. Uh, and he goes on to talk about, the, the, the end result of that and what that looks like. He talks about the futility of their thinking. In other words, it, it ends in nothing. It, it, it's futile, darkened in their understanding, separated from the life of God, uh, ignorant and hardened uh, in their hearts, uh, having lost all sensitivity to God, uh, people who are not moved by God at all, uh, moved to understand or know God, uh, move to please God, move to give glory to God. They enjoy what God has made, but don't acknowledge him. Uh, they've given themselves instead over to sensuality, so as to indulge every kind of impurity. And uh, certainly uh, the last uh, 20, maybe 60 years has been a, an ever giving over to impurity and, and people now defining their lives, defining who they are by their particular sexual obsessions uh, or, or um gender choices or whatever, they, they, they define themselves now by these things uh, and yet never satisfied. The last part of verse 19 says they are full of greed. In other words, well, whatever they're taking on, and, and they're taking on all sorts of things and, and uh, they're still not satisfied. They're still hungry for more, never uh, satisfied. As, as the great St. Augustine said, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. And so we come to verse 20, and I'm mainly going to look at verses 20 and, and uh, 21 today. Uh, he says, that is not, however, the way that you learned uh, things. That is not how you came to faith. Uh, literally, as the ESV puts it, that is not the way you learned Christ. You didn't learn Christ by uh, being dark in your understanding, by being hard-hearted, uh, by uh, giving yourself over uh, to your lust, uh, being greedy to, to uh, 
to fill yourself and to ignore God. That's not how you learned Christ. Uh, go back to how you came to faith. Uh, there was a softening. There was a, a work in your heart. Uh, there was a, a seeking after God. And uh, the word you in this, in this sentence is emphasized both by adding the pronoun. In Greek, you don't need to add the pronouns because the, the pronouns are, are found in the actual verbs. Uh, and also by putting you at the, at the, at the very first word in the sentence. Uh, this is not, however, the way you learned Christ. And as Paul has elsewhere has summed up the gospel as proclaiming Christ, so here he characterizes the gospel as learning Christ, the new pattern of desiring and behaving that flows from gratitude for God's grace in the gospel, the grace that uh, takes us as we are but doesn't leave us as we are. And unlike the self-satisfied pagans uh, set, settled in ignorance and darkness, the believer is always learning and always seeking to learn. Uh, the Christian is sensitive to both God and the things that God hates uh, and the things that God loves and is therefore sensitive to sin, not given over to sin but sensitive to it and, and wanting to stand apart from it. Uh, in stark contrast to those who walk in futility and ignorance, darkened in their understanding, cold towards God, abandoned to impurity, ever craving but never satisfied, the Christian who has learned Christ now lives a life of purpose and destiny. They know where they've come from. They know where they're going. Uh, they have a hope that can't be snuffed out. Uh, they're enlightened, receptive, warm and drawn to the things of God and given to him. And it's a life not abandoned to sinful desire as if nothing really matters. It's rather a life of hope seriousness, sensitivity to the moving of the Spirit of God. It's also a life alive to the unending, unfailing and incomparable love and faithfulness of God. And so we still enjoy the things of this world. We enjoy what God has made. Uh, we enjoy the, the, the world that we live in, but we don't just enjoy it and, 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 and have it serve ourselves. We acknowledge the giver as well as the gifts. Uh, those who are, are given to Christ have become sensitive to God. Their hearts are softened. Uh, Indian theologian uh, Sadhu Sundar Singh once said that he was uh, sitting on the bank of a river one day and he says, I picked up a solid round stone from the water and I broke it open. And this stone had been in the river for so long. And as I broke it open, he said it was perfectly dry in spite of the fact that it had been immersed in water for centuries. And he said the same is true of many people in the Western world. For centuries, they've been surrounded by Christianity. And even in the church, they lived immersed in the water of its benefits. And yet it has not penetrated their hearts. They do not love it. And the fault is not Christianity, he says, but men's hearts, which have been hardened by materialism and intellectualism. Uh, pride in their, in their heads, but, but not... Uh, not uh, having hearts that are open to God. Uh, to turn to God really requires heart surgery uh, and a heart surgery from God. Uh, to no longer have a hard heart but a soft and receptive heart is a work of God. Uh, and not just going to church but, and, and reading the Bible and listening to sermons, but by turning to God uh, and wanting to receive from him, there's a sense of uh, being like a flower that turns to the sun and seeking and wanting God to impart, being sensitive to the Holy Spirit, to the glory of God, uh, to the word and the work of Christ. And so compared to the greedy, self-obsessed, independent manner of the Gentiles, followers of Christ walk in humility, leaning on him. Uh, it's, the, it's accepting the offer that Christ makes to us when he says, take my yoke, take my burden upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And so instead of lives of ignorance and insulation from the things of God, true disciples go to Jesus and learn from him as a way of life. Indeed, the definition of a disciple is a learner. Uh, and I ask now, what do we give ourselves to to influence us? Part of being a Christian is someone who comes to Jesus and says, I want you, Jesus, to be my primary teacher. Uh, 
Uh, I see many believers in Jesus and particularly their children who have given themselves instead to large doses of media, TV and social media. They take on the world's fears, desires and concerns just like their neighbours. Uh, I see good thinking a a elderly people who have uh, just taken on the world's view because uh, they've exposed themselves regularly to, to large doses of the media and uh, it has pickled them. Uh, for the kingdom of God, uh, instead of being alive and, and fresh and 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 humble, uh, they've become bitter. Uh, they've become fearful because the media has has been their main teacher. Uh, young people uh, are being swayed by the uh, the voices around them, the social media around them, the uh, the culture around them, and and things are, are changing because of what they expose themselves to. Uh, God's people uh, see Jesus as their primary teacher, and that's what, that's what a disciple means. God's people have received a real touch from God that makes us different. The real love of Christ compels us to be different. I love how Paul describes his life in 2 Corinthians 5.14. He says, For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died, and he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. There's a definition of a Christian, someone who no longer lives for themselves, but lives for God. And so Paul reminds them of how they learned Christ. And again, it's not to say one group is good and one group is bad. The problem was this group at Ephesus had a foot in both camps, and Paul's trying to get them to live as they are. And he says, remember how... You came to faith. Remember how you learned Christ. Remember how you were taught Christ in verse 21, when you heard about Christ. Uh, and the Greek Greek here includes a tinge of doubt. Uh, I think the ESV translates it as, if indeed you have heard about him. Uh, Paul is reminding them of what is normal for God's new covenant people. He takes them back to those revealing moments when they first started to hear and understand about Christ. He reminds them and us who follow Jesus, who have been awakened to him. He, he says you weren't deaf or you weren't unresponsive, but the message of Jesus made an impression on you. Uh, Paul's al already referred to the manner of their coming to salvation in Ephesians 1.13 when he says you were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. There was an internal work of God. And God's people uh, now are changed. They're, they're alive to God. Uh, and as Jesus said, my sheep listen to my voice, I know them, and they follow me. Uh, he goes on in this verse uh, 21 to say, you were taught in him. They didn't just hear a message, they were instructed. They didn't just come forward at, a, at a, an evangelistic rally. Christ was proclaimed and the Ephesians were nurtured and grounded in the vital truths concerning Jesus. And it's an important thing when somebody comes to faith, uh, we don't just leave them like a little baby out to, to fend for themselves. We, we train them, we teach them, we show them how to feed themselves. Uh, and they were taught best because in the midst of the teaching, they were being taught by God. Uh, and, and the best teaching is the teaching that teaches people how to, to see what God is saying, gives them the skills to hear what God is saying to them, in and through the world. Most cults and most, in fact, all cults and false religion, uh, they leave the understanding up to the experts. You can't understand. You need to know Arabic if you're a Muslim. Uh, you can't understand. You need to know Latin if, you, if you're, you're a, a Latin mass Catholic or if you're, a, uh, if, if you're in the Middle Ages where the only Bibles were in Latin uh, and you had to rely on, on whatever, however the priest interpreted things. Uh, it's a, it's a keep, keeping, there's a, there's a teaching in Christianity uh, it's called the perspicuity, which is the clarity of things, that by the Holy Spirit's help, we can understand God's word. It's an amazing thing, a document 2,000 years old, and we read it, and it speaks directly to our hearts. And so you were taught in him, he says. Uh, Jesus' great commission to the people is to make disciples who obey everything I have commanded you, uh, everything that Jesus taught. And, and, and it's the truth uh, he says in verse 21, the truth that is in Jesus, the truth about Jesus, uh, not just rules of, of, a, of a meeting of a group of people, 
but the truth, the truth about Jesus, uh, the truth that Jesus taught and embodied during his earthly ministry. Uh, God had broken the cycle of death by giving them an understanding of his son and his work on their behalf. And so instead of being darkened and calloused and falsehood, the way of life and truth was open to them. It resonated to them as true. And there really is no other explanation for that but that it is true, uh, that it is proved to be true. Uh, it's an amazing thing when God turns this book uh, and reveals to the reader that it is true and it starts to really speak to us. Uh, I remember a, a friend of mine who was an atheist came to me when uh, when she was at university and we were always arguing about things of the faith. And uh, she said to me one day, her heart had softened a little bit and I was not very, I, I didn't take it very seriously, but she said, you know, I think uh, I think all religions are, are true. I think there's a truth in, in, in all religions. And, and I said rather callously, well, if everything's true, then nothing's true. Uh, and she got really angry and she stormed off. And uh, she went home and opened her Bible and she says, God, if you're real, you, you need to show me who, who you are. And she opened up to the Gospel of John and began reading. And as she, she began reading, she, uh, she realized that these words were true and they spoke to her. And she came to me the next day and said, I think I believe that the, the Bible. She said, I don't believe that there's a devil, but I, I think there is a God. And, and I, re- I didn't, wasn't so harsh this time. I said, oh, that's great. God is doing a work. And, uh, and, and she went on to, to marry a, a pastor and a, is walking with the Lord to this day. But God revealed the truth that is in Jesus, the truth of his word. Uh, and so uh, uh, there's a supernatural work in Jesus. Uh, 1 John 5.20 says this, We know also that the Son of God has come and given us understanding. How do we know that the Son of God has given us understanding? John goes on to say, so that we may know him who is true. When God gives us understanding, we begin to know Jesus who is true. And we are in him who is true by being in his son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Uh, And so we come to this command in verse 22, very important command. Really the, uh, the heart of this passage is this idea of putting off something and putting on something. Uh, I had a look at Martin Lloyd-Jones. I think he's got about 10 sermons on these few on these verses, and uh, there's so much here. But he says in, in verse 22, he says, You were taught with regard to your former way of life. Remember how you used to live. And he brings them back to the beginnings in their Christian life again and reminds them that they were taught uh, something about their, their former ways. He, he describes their former way of life as an empty life. Peter calls it the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. Uh, when I was growing up and and uh, Bible was being removed from schools and, and there was no uh, Christian influence on, on children anymore, uh, and yet most of them lived with a kind of a Christian morality. Uh, but I always ask myself, what are these children going to pass on to their children? What's the next generation going to be like? And we're seeing that now, uh, children who have no sense of what is right or what is wrong and and take on whatever the world tells them is important. Uh, it's an empty way of life when we don't have God's truth. Uh, and so Paul's wanting them to, to think of their former life and remember that it was an old experiment that has been tried extensively and found wanting. Uh, Peter again says, you've spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery and lust and drunkenness, orgy, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. Uh, I love hearing, don't you love hearing testimonies about people who have been redeemed from that empty way of life that they once gave themselves to? Uh, I love David, David's words. He said, he reached down from on high and he took hold of me and he drew me out of deep waters. I love to hear testimonies of those whose lives have been turned around. We have people in this church who can talk about dramatic changes as God has pulled them out of deep waters and brought them to himself. Uh, But I also like to hear the stories of those who have been raised in Christian homes and walked accordingly and never wandered off, at least not for long. Uh, Some some people will say to me, I don't really have a testimony Uh, You might say you don't have a testimony, uh, but that itself is a testimony to God, uh, that God has been at work in your life and has been been protecting you. Uh, In fact, make it your aim, young people, to have a boring testimony uh, because that means that you've been giving God glory 
uh, and not and not uh, putting your life in the things that are futile and dangerous. And so he says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off, to put off your old self, uh, to put off, to, to and, it, and it's a word that's used to remove one's clothes, to change clothes. The imagery signifies an exchange of identities. Uh, it's in the aorist tense, which means a one-off. It denotes a one-off for all definite, concluding action, the stripping off to be done at once and to be done for good. Uh, the old self was to be put off uh, like you would take off a withering jacket and throw it in the bin, not even worthy of the op shop. Uh, you know, as someone who uh, likes to keep an eye on, on conspiracy theories sometimes, and particularly during COVID, uh, we got on board our family very quickly with the idea that the COVID virus was modified in a Chinese lab. And so at the very beginning, we took it very seriously. Uh, we were bleaching even our supermarket shopping. Uh, to protect it. Uh, it later came out that the virus didn't really last long on surfaces, so that was largely unnecessarily. Uh, but along the way, as we're bleaching all our shopping, I destroyed quite a few good shirts in the process. Uh, and I had this shirt that, that I used to wear all the time. It, it had all my favourite colours combined. It was just the right mix of casual and formal, and it was very comfortable. And it became one of the casualties of my bleaching. And no matter how much I tried to save it, fix it, and, and still wear it, it was all futile. That shirt, apart from going to a Woodstock festival, uh, would never work again. There was nothing to do in the end but to reluctantly throw it away. And that is what Paul is saying here, except it's not the shirt that's changed, it's you. It's anyone who is in Christ. It doesn't match anymore. There's no making it work. Who you are and what you are, uh, and what you once wore is now incompatible. You are no longer what you once were. Those clothes don't match. They are out of place. They are not you. And he's not talking here uh, specifically about clothes. There may be clothes that aren't suitable anymore, but he's talking about your former way of life, the way you used to live. Put it off, he says. Uh, believers must make a fundamental break with their past, their old self. And that contrasts with the new self, who we are in Christ. Christ has made us anew. We're recreated. We're regenerated. We're born again. The old self is the pre-conversion, unregenerate person who is ruled by sin and lives under the, dom the dominion of this present evil age. Uh, Ephesians 4.22 describes the negative side of regeneration. We put off the former self. And verses 23 to 24 point to the positive side. We put on our new self. We put on Christ. And while we're dealing with the putting on of the new self uh, uh, and, and putting off the old self, uh, this week we're looking mainly at the putting off, but I don't want to separate them. They must not be separated, the putting off and the putting on. Uh, to just do one uh, would mean that you, you, you spiritually are going around naked. Uh, and it's even worse than that. When you just deal with moral issues, when you stop doing the bad stuff, when you stop living by the ways of the world, but you don't, put on Christ, you don't fill yourself with the Spirit of God, uh, Jesus says you actually end up in a worse position. Uh, you remember what he says in, in the Gospels when he talks about an impure spirit that comes out of a spirit. So the person's been cleaned, cleansed of an evil spirit, uh, but all that's left is emptiness. And then it says the spirit goes and finds seven other spirits and comes back to that empty house that's now been cleaned up and, uh, and the final condition is worse than the first. Uh, it's not enough just to put off. We need to put on. And, and Paul describes conversion as putting on Christ. Uh, the image of that is taking off frayed clothes and putting on new ones. Uh, Paul makes explicit that it's a change of identity from Adam to Christ. We were in Adam. We were part of Adam's uh, descendants and Adam's, Adam's sin. And now we're part of Christ. We're in Christ. And you can't do that half on, half off. It has to be a, a full taking off and, and a putting on. Uh, and so we're going to look at putting off this week, but don't separate it from the putting on, which we'll look at next week. Uh, putting off also means turning around. It's going a new direction. I was running my life. Now Christ is running my life. I'm in, I'm in Christ. I'm, I once was an Adam. Now I'm in Christ. The old man and the new man. Our old way of life 
Before we believed in Christ as completely in the past, we should put it behind us like old clothes to be thrown away. And when we decide to accept Christ's gift of salvation, uh, this putting off is, is both a one-time decision uh, as well as a daily conscious commitment. Uh, we are not to be driven uh, by desire and impulse any longer. We must put on the new nature, head in the new direction, and have this new way of thinking that the Holy Spirit gives. And part of putting off is not to hide anymore, but to openly confess our sin and disassociate with them. Uh, Proverbs 28, 13 says, Whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Putting off means forsaking. It means returning to the Lord and removing detestable things, idols, and no longer going uh, to the ashtray of our past and rifling through the ashes there. Uh, this requires some vulnerability, uh, nakedness, and abandoning, abandoning oneself to the Lord as opposed to, to trying in vain to shield oneself from him. Uh, Paul, in fact, says to the Romans, he tells us that the old self is already dead and that it was pointless to try and resuscitate it and give life to it or service to it. Romans 6.6 6 says, For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Now, people often say, I'm going to leave God because I want to be free. Uh, there's no option. You're either slave to sin or you're slave to God. Uh, and so he says, put it to death. He says, take off your old self. Uh, in one sense, it's already dead, but we've got to keep, uh, a, we have a daily conscious commitment to, to keep putting it off, to keep it dead. Uh, because sometimes you might have a tyrant who's leading a country. Uh, you might even have a tyrant who's leading a state. And, uh, and, and the impact that that tyrant has had on you might be so pervasive, might be so impactful that even if you were to see them today, you would be fearful. Uh, there's people in places where they've had a, 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 a tyrannical ruler, a dictator, and uh, even when that dictator has died or, or stood down, there's, there's still this fear. They still feel in slavery. It takes people a long time to, uh, to realize that they're no longer under, under the control of that, of that uh, leader. Uh, and so in Paul's writings, there's a tension between putting off the old self and acknowledging that the old self is finished, crucified, dead. Uh, in Colossians, Paul suggests that although the old self has been taken off, the stench is still hanging around and the practices still seek to bring us into its grip. Uh, Lloyd-Jones compares it to trying, to trying to drive two horses at once. Uh, and so in Colossians, he says, you used to walk in these ways in the, in the life you once lived, Colossians 3.8, but now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices. Uh, it's done. So there's this decisive putting off. Uh, there's this decisive putting off uh, as a way of life the way you used to live, uh, because you have a new master, you have a new ruler. Uh, and it can't be fixed, uh, it can't be repaired, it must be removed, thrown out like a, a pair of old man's underpants, and only you married people know exactly what I mean by that. Uh, there's, there's some underpants you just can't redeem anymore, they must go, and singlets are the same, uh, they have to be thrown out. Uh, it's graphic, uh, but holding on to one's old self is like holding on to a circumcised foreskin. Uh, and that's probably graphic to you. But this is what Paul says in Colossians 2.11. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. And Paul is just as graphic here in Ephesians where he he compares holding on to the old man as 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 like carrying around a decaying carcass. Uh, he says of the old self, it is being corrupted. The whole character rep represent representing the former self was not only corrupt, but growing ever more and more corrupt. Uh, this this, this uh, old self is not just corrupt, but it's corrupting. 
and every trait of the old man's behaviour is putrid, crumbling or inflated like rotting waste of cadavers, stinking, ripe for being disposed of and forgotten. Uh, the kind of imagery with this word corrupt is, is words like rust, mould, spoilt milk, a rotting vegetable or off meat. And Paul says, stop trying to wear it. It's not you, it's gross. Uh, and one of the reasons uh, the old self is to be done away with, even put to death, uh, and to keep it dead is that it's being corrupted like a mouldy potato in a bag of potatoes. You've ever had that where you pull out a, a, a one bad potato and it's, a, it's affected the other ones. It isn't long before it starts affecting the good stuff. And so just as Joseph had to remove his jacket to remove Potiphar's wife, our old self has much corrupting influence attached to it. The old self has passed its used by date. It's off. It's going mouldy, it's decaying, and it's destined to destroy. Uh, similar to an alcoholic, the old self must be completely starved, completely denied. And the stakes are high. Uh, there is this corrupting influence that will rapidly spoil us if left unchecked. And to escape the corruption of this world, uh, how do we stop it? How do we stop the, dis the corruption of this old self? Well, we let the word of God work in us. And so James 1.21 says, Get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word that has been planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. And so the old self must be put off. It's, being, it's corrupting, it's corrupted, and it's corrupted how? By the last part of this, by its deceitful desires. What is causing this corruption? It's the, it's the cravings of the old self, the old uh, selfish desires uh, that end, end in vain, that end in futility. Uh, there, there is deceit in those desires as they do not fix. The desires do not help. They only add to the corruption. Uh, it's a deceptive food. It's a delusional food. Uh, delusion is a good word to describe it. It may even appear attractive, but it needs to be done away with. Uh, one of the biggest deceptions is that following these desires will somehow sustain or protect you or get you through. Uh, often like the lady who swallowed a spider to get rid of the fly and finally ends up eating and being finished off by a horse. And so often the fixes we choose only are bigger problems to deal with smaller trouble. And so the most tragic picture of this is Adam and Eve. You remember Adam and Eve who, through the desires, became corrupt and corrupted the human race. And so just as grace works in us and through us to others, so does deception and corruption. 2 Timothy 3.13 says, Evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. And so the end of deception is really destruction. And so Paul reminds them that they've escaped the corruption of the past and have, have, have done so because the defeated past uh, has been done away with in Christ. We've been crucified with Christ. The old self is dead and we need to keep it dead. We need to defeat it by remembering what has happened. Uh, and so we need to let God's word live in us, but we also need to remember what God has done in us and who we are. The death of the old self, the cleansing and the resurrection to new life must all be remembered and studied and, and, and reminded of these things. And so the new father uh, will sometimes feel still like a single man and needs to remember now that he's a father and not live as if he's a single man. Uh, sometimes uh, we need to just remind ourselves of who we are in Christ. Another way to avoid being swamped under the tide of deceitful desires is by encouraging one another. Uh, Hebrews 3.13 says, Encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. And so this putting off, uh, how, do we, how do we keep the rotting carcass that wants to take control of us again, the tyrant that, that's been killed but we still live in fear of it or, or, or are swayed by it? Uh, we let God's word uh, work in us. We, we, we let it. Uh, daily speak to us we remember who we are we preach the gospel to ourselves 
and, and remember that we are new people in Christ. The, we re remember the, about the death of the old self, the cleansing that Christ has brought about, and the resurrection to, to new life. And we walk uh, with our brothers and sisters, and we encourage one another. Uh, this is how uh, Eugene Peterson uh, interprets this verse, verse 22. He says, Since then we do not have the excuse of ignorance. Uh, everything, and I do mean everything, connected with that old way of life has to go. It's rotten through and through. Get rid of it and then take on an entirely new way of life, a God-fashioned life. Uh, essentially, what Paul is saying to the church at Ephesus and, and, and all of you who are in Christ is to live and be as you are, not as you were. Uh, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the decisive recreating work that has been done in your people, Lord. You have taken a, a stony heart and given us a, a soft heart. You have given us a, a fleshy heart instead of a, a stony heart that is alive to you. Father, you have uh, remade us. You have made us born again. We are born spiritually. Uh, we've been uh, adopted into your family. And yet, Father, we acknowledge that sometimes we uh, carry around the clothes and the baggage and, and the carcass of our old life and we allow ourselves to be swayed by who we were, what we were. Father, help us uh, to be clear about what you have done in us, who you have made us to be as, as new creations in Christ. The old has gone, the new has come. And Father, uh, may we continue to, to speak this, this gospel, the gospel of new life, in Christ, may we speak this gospel to ourselves every day and not let the devil want to want to reattach us to what we were. We thank you that in Christ the old is God and the new has come. And a day will come when this old self will be completely uh, done away with. We thank you, Lord, for the resurrection body, for the resurrection life, and we thank you that that life is beginning now in Christ, that that work has been decisively done. And help us, Lord, to decisively do away uh, with what we once were and to live for you, to be a dead to sin but alive to God, to live as you have made us in Jesus' name.